Hello, YouTube. My name is Alan, and it's that time, once again, let's talk metal. Tonight, it is time for another heavy metal book report, and the book that I recently finished reading and thought I would talk about for just a bit is the autobiography from K.K. Downing. It's called Heavy Duty, Days and Nights in Judas Priest. This was first published in 2018, and sort of, you know, chronicles the role that K.K. Downing had as you know, one half of one of the most famous guitar tandems in all of heavy metal history. So right off the bat, to preface this, there's obviously been some animosity between K.K. Downing and other members of Judas Priest in recent years, you know, since he, you know, left the band after, you know, the Nostradamus album and tour cycle. Different people, of course, have different takes on this kind of thing. I had last year read Rob Halford's autobiography that came out, but that came out, you know, a couple of years after this one. Enjoyed Halford's biography quite a bit. You can watch my older heavy metal book report video on that volume if you'd like to find out more about it. But uh, KK's book came out a couple of years before that in 2018. So this does not reference anything from Halford's book. It couldn't since it came out uh, before that one. And as I recall, Halford's book didn't really heavily reference anything about KK's book. You know, so there's not necessarily a war of words happening between the two between the two books. It seems, if anything, the two got along pretty well in Priest. You know, while there was you no know, friction at times, it doesn't seem like a lot of it was between Halford and uh, Downing. KK is pretty, you know, polite and very respectful of Halford throughout, you know, the vast majority of this book. You know, always noting that you know, Halford was really the thing that got them over the top as a band and took them, you know, to those really stratospheric levels of success that Judas Priest enjoyed throughout the 1980s. KK is not as uh, forgiving as some other members, though. So we'll talk about that here in a moment. Uh, in terms of, you know, overall, the book is about 300 pages in the paperback edition that I got. It's a very easy read. I think I knocked this out in two, maybe two and a half days. And I'm not actually a particularly fast reader. I usually tend to read much slower than other folks. I just, I guess I take my time or, you know, my eyesight's not great. So that can be an issue. But yeah, even for me, this was only like a two or three day read. So if you're interested in it, it's not a big time commitment. It's a very easy read, um, goes pretty quick. It is structured pretty similar to most such autobiographies. One thing I like, you know, there's a very short prologue uh, from uh, KK in it. And it simply starts, you know, Reno, Nevada, June 16th, 1990, which isn't necessarily the date you'd expect at the very beginning of a priest autobiography. It's obviously not KK's, you know, birthday. It's not when one of the first albums comes out or anything. But, yeah, for those in the know, this is the date when their trial began in Nevada regarding, you know, the two fans who had shot themselves reportedly while listening to a Judas Priest album. And, you know, Certain entities had come after the band trying to hold them somehow responsible for, you know, backwards messages in the music. The prologue's only barely over one full page of text. You, know, you have this page and this. But it actually is written quite well. It really does draw you in right away. You know, it's kind of, you know, giving KK's, you know, thoughts on you know, what he was feeling that day, arriving at the courthouse, going into court with his bandmates, and then having those court doors close. And, but what really makes it uh, compelling isn't just the fact that she was like, okay, now I feel like we're in, you know, you know, shit just got real or anything like that. That you know, he actually relates it, you know, back to the same feeling he had through a lot of his childhood with his upbringing. That you know, he was once again feeling you know, very kind of you know powerless or helpless, and that other people were just going to sort of, if they wanted to, put their thumb on him and kind of mash him down, and it made him you know a very sick feeling. So I thought it was you know, a very good prologue. Prologue's a lot of times something you barely even read, but you know, this one right away kind of you know, piques your interest because it's like, huh, there's a connection between that you know, high-profile event in the 90s and something that happened to this guy you know, way back you know, in his childhood in the 1950s. 
So it kind of you know, very much wants you to get you interested and wants you to start reading the rest of the book right away, which I did. From there, it follows you know, a very typical autobiographical pattern. There's a few chapters dedicated to early childhood, growing up, formative years, all of that stuff, before you, of course, finally get to the music part when he's a teenager and listening to bands and starting you know, to find his way as a guitarist. That formative material in this case, I think it's a lot more important than it is in some autobiographies. Sometimes it feels a little tacked on at the front, like, well, we kind of have to cover this, but it's not necessarily that engaging. Yeah, In KK's case, you know, he takes time to explain some of you know, his home life, which was not particularly pleasant. You know, growing up very poor, you know, in sort of, you know, uh, you know Midlands uh, area, or again, my British geography is not great. Maybe it was a little further north, but I'm thinking it was Midlands. Um, and that, yeah, you know, it had you know, a very big psychological effect on him throughout his life. And I think it's something important to remember with this book. It's being written, you know, from the vantage point of, you know, KK, you know, by the time this came out, he wasn't quite 70. He would have been about 68, 67 at the time of publication. So, you know, he's able to write this with hindsight uh, and then see how these different things through his life came together and how they affected, you know, even things from early years, how it affected his career as a musician and had affected his mentality as a band member. And he's pretty, you know, blunt about those connections. He's just like, yeah, you know, I can see that, you know, my his dad was one of these kind of, you know, chronically unemployed, addicted to gambling, apparently had, you know, some, you know, legitimate mental health issues that at the time, of course, you know, uh, 1950s, you know, Britain weren't diagnosed and weren't treated at all. And it, you know, really made his, you know, childhood and, you know, growing up very, very uh, unpleasant and tough in a lot of ways. Won't go into the details. You can read the book if you want more of that. So one thing you get, you know, right there, you know, from those chapters describing his father is that, you know, um, KK is not going to hold back on these people that uh, he has no love loss for. He's not here to, you know, gloss it over or put a nice facade on it. Uh, he's kind of like, you know, I was an asshole and I really, you know, fucked me up in a lot of ways. Uh, so he's very plain and blunt about it. At the same time, he's able to do that, again, with this vantage point of looking back over time. You know, he can look at it now and be like, yes, it was horrible and I'm not going to gloss over that. But it, I can also see where it maybe motivated me to get out of that house as soon as possible and motivated me to become more independent and, you know, really, you know, set certain goals that I wasn't going to end up like that loser piece of trash. Um, so, yeah, it's interesting that, you know, he's not really pulling his punches, but, you know, he does qualify those things only in the sense that, you know, it was a long time ago, you know, I have I have grown up, I've moved past that. I'm just able to, you know, kind of, you know, see the connections. It's that, you know, almost philosophical thing where people are like, you know, oh, yes, we're all just being manipulated all the time. But at some point, you know, as you get older and if you're relatively smart, you start to understand how those strings are being pulled. You're not necessarily free from them, but you at least see the connections. And you know that if this happens, yeah, it's, that's connected to this. And I, I know how it works now. And that's the sense I get from... Uh, you know, downing in this book. Uh, you know, from there again, goes into you know, his early musical career. One thing that was interesting to me that I didn't actually know about the guy, he was a huge Hendrix fan and actually got to see Hendrix live, I think on four occasions uh, around the UK during, you know, that short but uh, kind of brilliant period where Jimi Hendrix was, you know, redefining music and especially electric guitar. So kind of cool to hear those stories. Um even from you know, those kind of stories, when he's talking about you know his biggest guitar idol, he does a good job of kind of just you know here's the story, go through it basically, and now let's move on. So you know he gives you the details, you know, but it doesn't belabor the point. It doesn't become you know three chapters about just his obsession with Hendrix or anything. He keeps the stories flowing quite well, and it keeps the book moving along. It's why again, it's a very very easy read. You know, as you get into the years with Judas Priest, it's written from a pretty similar vantage point. 
here's the basics. You know, here's what we're doing at each time. Members come, members go. We record this album. But, you know, he doesn't spend 20 pages telling you how, how uh, they made decisions to record Sad Wings of Destiny this way versus that way or anything. So it's like, eh, here's, you know, the basic facts about it. And from my point of view, and here's how it went over. And now let's move on to the next thing. Things with, uh, you know, the priest lineup, of course, you know, it gets a little more tangled once, you know, Glenn Tipton is in the picture. You know, Downing and Tipton famously, you know, have not gotten along in a long time. Um, and Downing, you know, cited that, you know, as that relationship, you know, is a big part of the reason he finally decided to leave Priest. The overarching theme through, you know, all the Judas Priest material, which of course is most of the book, is that Downing, from his perspective, the way he tells it at this point in time, is that, you know, him and Glenn never were really on the same wavelength as individuals. Musically, of course, you know, they found ways to coexist and play in the band together. But he's like, you know, even from the time the guy, you know, auditioned for the band, I just, you know, didn't quite like him. That, you know, there were certain things about, you know, Glenn and the way he made decisions and did politics in the band that KK, you know, was very uh, much kind of the polar opposite. He didn't like those things. Uh, and so that kind of grated on him and built up for a long time. Folks may ask, you know, why didn't Downing quit earlier? Why didn't he put his foot down on some of these things? And that's, again, where Downing, looking back now, is like, a lot of this is because of the way I was brought up. You know, and brought up in, you know, what's you know, sort of you know, basically an abusive household. Uh, as a little kid, you don't really have an option of fighting back. You, you know, a lot of times you just learn to, you know, shut your mouth and, you know, deal with it until you can get out of that situation eventually. He's like, and, you yeah, know, looking back, I've approached a lot of, other things in my life that same way. I put up with a lot of stuff in the band and that maybe I shouldn't have or that I should have spoken up more or tried to put my foot down more, but it's how I learned to cope with things early on in life. And as such, it's how I coped with things in the band. You know, and he's pretty straightforward. He's like, not saying it was a good approach. Maybe I should have done some of it different, but he understands at this point in his life, there's a reason that... I handled my relationship with Tipton the way that I did and my relationship with the rest of the band the way that I did. And again, he doesn't really have bad things to say about, you know, many other folks in the band. There are certain, you know, managers he liked more than others, one he didn't like. He actually speaks very complimentary of the labels that they worked with. You know, even with Gull, you know, they had a lot of issues with Gull, who owned the rights to their early material forever and ever, uh, which, of course, has pissed you know, a lot of the band's infrastructure off. But you know, even here, Dan is like, well, yeah, you know, uh, not a great situation, but they did give us a break. And when we were needing one to kind of you know, get to that next stage and get an album out was a huge deal for me. So yeah, uh, very complimentary regarding Sony CBS and the band's relationship with that. Very polite to uh, you know, Tim Owens and the, his time in the band. Yeah, again, you know, very, you know, speaks well of, you know, Ian Hill and Halford and such too. So, yeah, anybody who's wanting to you know, just read, you know, a total flamethrower of a book, you know, Jerry Springer in print form or something, this, you may be disappointed. You might be expecting that, you know, based on, you know, sort of, you know, the toxic, you know, relationship that's been portrayed in the press and stuff. And again, he makes no bones about the fact that, you know, he did not get along with Tipton. He was, didn't appreciate the way Tipton approached live performances, the way he, you know, would try to, you know, get his way when it came to, you know, decisions of the band. He's very straightforward about that. But at the same time, you also get the sense it's from that vantage point of, you know, yes, that stuff made me angry at the time. Yeah, I still don't like it. But it's not eating me up day by day. I'm not sitting here fuming over it now 30 years later. I'm, I've moved on. You know, At the end of the book, you know, he does make a point to you, sort of, you know, send you know, uh, Glenn best wishes in his you know, battle with Parkinson's. That, you know, that really sucks. And that he hopes he you know, can work through it as well, best as he can. He doesn't talk you know, too much about the Priest album's that happened to you after he left because, you know, in his own words, he's like, I, I moved on. I was, you know, doing stuff. 
apparently, you know, he's been a big golfer his entire life. He has a few funny golf stories mentioned here. He worked on, you know, one of his pieces of property there in England, turning it into a golf course. So he's kind of like, yeah, I'm just, I'm busy doing other things. I'm not keeping up with, you know, the day-to-day -day dramas of you know, Judas Priest and whatnot. Um, something that's interesting that I didn't realize was going to happen is this book ends before he had started working on the KK's Priest project. I had the timeline wrong in my head. I thought the last couple of chapters would be about him recruiting musicians to kind of put together his own new project that in one where maybe he had a little more control or didn't feel, you know, as much tension in dealing with people that there was just too much baggage uh, from the past. But the book ends before that point. You know, when you get to the end of this, you know, KK is in retirement from music and just, you know, yeah, doing his golf real estate stuff. And you know, he seems content with that place. So, yeah, but then after that, in the past few years, of course, he's since done two albums with the KK's Priest Project. It would have been nice if that was included in here, but the timing's just wrong. For the record, I have not heard any of the KK's Priest material, to my knowledge. Maybe it played on YouTube in the background someday at work and I didn't register it. Um, I've glanced at the records. I've noticed people seem to have very varying opinions that some folks think it's very strong material, better than what Priest has been doing. Other people don't seem to enjoy it. They seem to think it's just very derivative of, you know, his older material. I have noticed in just like, you know, looking at the song titles and stuff, you know, there's a lot of self-referential material there from old Judas Priest titles and all, which, uh, I mean, geez, the guys, you know, <laughs> in Priest, you know, almost from day one, you could call it day one, depending on if you want to count that real early version of Judas Priest as still part of the band's whole legacy. But uh, he's as entitled as anyone from Judas Priest to certainly, you know, reuse some of those you know names and song titles and put a little spin on them if that's what he wants to do. At the same time, I can see why some people might think that's a little cheesy and why they might ask themselves, like, you know, if you had all these issues with Priest in the past... Why are you taking your new project and sort of building it like it's, you know, sort of some kind of weird shadow clone of all these old priest ideas? Why not take it in its own direction? I don't know. Again, haven't heard the music, haven't read anything from Downing commenting about why he's chosen that direction for some of the aesthetics around KK's Priest. So can't really say. Anyway, to wrap this up. I found this to be you know, a good read. Uh, you know, I like the fact that, yeah, he's very straightforward about things. There's only maybe one or two times that it felt like you know he was tiptoeing around certain things a little bit. Uh, the situation with Dave Holland would be one of those in particular. You know, he, he gives you know uh, his opinion of it, but you know, he's very careful not to talk about any of the allegations or stuff like that. So. Yeah, even for Downing, it seems like that's the type of like, eh, I'm not going to get into that one too much here. We're just going to move on past that. And I noticed Halford did the same thing with that particular situation. It's obviously a pretty icky topic to have to delve into. And uh, yeah, there's not much insight uh, to be gained on that scenario from either of their books. But yeah, if you have a chance to read it, if you're interested in the band, their history, I think this is a good read. I know some people have avoided it because they didn't want to just have 300 pages of you know, KK complaining and griping about everything. But it really doesn't turn into that. And I think, you know, especially with the insights you know, from his early life, you start to understand why things you know, bothered him the way they did but also why he kept them bottled up a lot. You know, how the only thing in Halford's book where he kind of commented that it ties into this, you know, Halford acknowledged that, yeah, you know, th when things would happen in Priest, sometimes, you know, they would affect KK very differently than other members. And, you know, he would get a lot more upset about things, certain things than anyone else did. And the rest of us didn't really see what the problem was. But knowing a little bit more about his upbringing, it starts to make a little more sense. Uh, the last one I'll point out, um, one person, or I should say, I guess, group that uh, Downing famously had issues with was Iron Maiden. You get a few more insights into where that animosity came from. And that's very different from Halford's take. In Halford's autobiography, 
you know, he never personally felt there was supposed to be this big rivalry between the bands or he didn't have a lot of issues with them. KK certainly did. <laughs> and, uh, you know, he spells out why that is. But even that, it's very much in the case of this is why I got pissed off at them 40 years ago. And I'll say it very plainly. But I'm not mad at them today. I'm not, you know, sitting here hating Paul Deano with every strain of my being. He's like, yeah, if I run into Paul, we'll probably have a beer and talk about the old times. It's, you know, it's water on the, under the bridge. And we crossed that bridge 40 some years ago. So it seems like, you know, Downing is being honest about things. But he's also got the right kind of perspective that, yeah, he's looking back on things and not letting them define where he's at, at least as of 2018. So that'll do it for this book report. Now let's talk heavy metal books in the comments down below. If you've read this, what was your take on it? Did you feel it was a good, honest, uh, straightforward take from KK? Did you feel there was anything he was being disingenuous about? Do you feel there were certain things he should have spent more time on? Because again, he goes through things at a relatively fast clip. There are certain things that you really, really wanted more details about that uh, you just didn't get out of this one. Leave a comment down below so other folks will know. That'll help them decide if it's a book they want to pick up, buy, purchase, download, read, whatever. Check out and spend their time on. All right, that'll do it for this time. So until next time, everybody take care, and as always, uh, keep banging your head.